this one uh, was a practice gap again that we felt uh, from the PDC to uh, bring up. It was we uh, discussed it at the Ameri at the APSA meeting this year. So the vignette is that of a nine month old boy who presents to the emergency room with a history of being lethargic, has a temperature of 39.8 degrees centigrade, so is febrile, has a, is tachycardic at 180, has a systolic blood pressure of 60, so is somewhat hypotensive, with warm extremities. Um, during the course of that uh, ED visit, uh, he gets intubated and uh, receives a total of 60 cc's of normal saline uh, uh, boluses, uh, 60 cc's per kilo, uh, over three 20 cc per kilo boluses. Uh, his uh, hemoglobin on evaluation was 12 grams per deciliter. So at this point, uh, you note that he continues to have a systolic blood pressure in the 60s despite those boluses. And you did administer broad spectrum antibiotics uh, during this first hour that this child was in the uh, ED. So according to the, the sepsis guidelines um, from the surviving sepsis campaign, the next best step is um, to start an epinephrine infusion. And the, the, what they say in, in their guidelines, uh, which first came up in 2004, modified in 2008, just think of it as it comes with every, every Olympics. The last time it was uh, modified was in 2016. Uh, the latest pediatric guidelines are 2012, and they talk about the importance of fluid bolus. So one, recognize that this is a child who may have sepsis. Two, initiate fluid management. Three, initiate broad spectrum antibiotics. Four, if they are still hypotensive despite the fluid boluses, at that point you must consider initiating vasopressors. The question then is which vasopressor should you use? And um, in adults, it's actually norepinephrine is the vasopressor of choice. Hmm. For children, uh, for uh, the longest time, dopamine used to be our fallback for when we, we wanted to use a vasopressor. Uh, there are two randomized trials that have been recently concluded, which showed that when you compare dopamine with epinephrine, which was the, the comparison, uh, actually mortality was better in one of the studies for those who were randomized to epi. And in the other study, epi had a better um, improvement or more rapid and sustained improvement in the systolic blood pressure complaint compared to dopamine. So epinephrine is probably of the, of the choices, epinephrine would be the treatment of choice. Others would say, what about vasopressin? There's some good uh, adult data to suggest that the use of vasopressin or vasopressin-like drugs um, can be very efficacious in increasing their blood pressure. Um, in pediatric trials, they've just been too few and not randomized, therefore the data is not there yet. So we have to stay tuned for that. Um, the next final question is where is, what is the role of hydrocortisone? And so, in fact, in the surviving sepsis campaign, there is a role for hydrocortisone, and that is for patients who are vasopressor refractory, meaning you started vasopressors and their systolic blood pressure remains low. Mm -hmm. The next algorithmic step is to consider hydrocortisone for vasopressor um, recalcitrant uh, um, blood pressure issues. Okay. Um, we also have a question from the audience uh, for Dr. Barley. Um, there was a question about uh, for duodenal atresia specifically, um, starting preoperative antibiotics, uh, because they would do that because of the risk for bacterial translocation. So they were wondering why you wouldn't give preoperative antibiotics for duodenal atresia. So the reason that we would not is because we would take the child to the operating room on a fairly not, I, want, I don't want to say urgent, but on an expeditious basis. So um, babies with duodenal atresia at our institution go to the OR the next morning or as soon as their echo is done. And I guess that would depend upon how long they think it's going to be before they can get the child to the operating room. So again, it just, this just goes up to showing what the uh, sepsis, pediatric sepsis guidelines are, which were from 2012. You give 20 cc per kilo boluses of isotonic fluid, in this case saline, or you can give colloid if you choose to do so, like albumin. 
uh, up to 60 ml per kilo. Um, your goal is perfusion improvement. So with this, with at 40 cc's per kilo, if you're seeing perfusion improvement, you don't have to give the third bolus. Your, your goal is to see perfusion improvement. Um, you stop if you're seeing over perfusion. For example, patients develop um, uh, RALs on uh, auscultation or their liver gets large and, and enlarged. You must start antibiotics. Um, there's data to show in adults especially that if you wait over three hours to start antibiotics in a patient who's septic, uh, and they're all, these are all empiric antibiotics, that your, your survival goes down. So you must do that. If their hematocrit is, or hemoglobin is less than 10, then a transfusion may be indicated in this particular scenario uh, because of um, their actively being septic. There's no role for pro activated protein C uh, in this situation. So again, uh, sepsis guidelines recognize flow fluids, antibiotics, and vasopressors if needed, all within the first hour. The question from Dr. Harmon was, is, was there recommendations on which antibiotics? The recommendation is broad spectrum. So you want to cover pretty much everything. Um, think something like an extended spectrum penicillin, like uh, um, piperacillin tazobactam or ampicillin selbactam, uh, something which is, again, very broad spectrum. You want to cover everything. It's empiric, so you want to cover everything. And if you're concerned about fungal infection, throw that in as well. Um, so broad spectrum antimicrobial therapy. And in terms of cultures, uh, I know in the adult world we say, Try to get them before we start mm -hmm. antibiotics, but don't delay starting the antibiotics if you're waiting for the call. Well, that, that's a great question, and that's a great point. Um, this, the revised guidelines in adults came out last year, 2016, uh, in fact, emphasized that you draw blood. And you draw blood for a few things. One, to check a lactate level. Two, to send uh, cultures just prior to starting the antibiotics. You don't wait, but you want to send those cultures as soon as possible because that led... Everybody uh, in the previous sepsis campaigns, it led to patients being on antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, for a very prolonged period of time. And so what came up as a, a subsequent recommendation was antibiotic stewardship, as Dr. Byerly mentioned um, in her previous discussion, that you follow those cultures and titrate those antibiotics down or stop them altogether if in three or four days patients have improved and it's no longer an infectious issue. Thank you. Salim, I think the other one more thing that you might want to talk about or you may want to mention is surviving sepsis as source control. So where does that fall in on the surviving yeah. sepsis campaign? So the adult surviving sepsis campaign, which was revised, talks about managing infection, uh, managing resuscitation, using ventilation where required, and then finally system improvement. When you talk about the manage infection part, uh, antibiotics is just one thing. Source control is key. So if you have an abscess, if you have... Uh, somebody who has a perforated appendicitis or uh, something of that nature, source control is key. And as the third part of managed infection, they introduced antibiotic stewardship as part of the whole deal. Um, in fact, the odds ratio for, in one study, for not starting antibiotics within three hours in children was a 3.92 odds ratio of dying, almost four times likely to die. Uh, and then same thing in managed resuscitation, fluids, you have a target, a uh, mean arterial pressure target, and the use of vasopressors. So it, these, these steps have been shown to clearly reduce mortality in patients with sepsis. And then, of course, now we have to deal with when they've survived sepsis, which now a lot more are, what are the consequences of that? And now we're, there's more discussion on the consequences of sepsis. Perfect. Uh, did can you I ask one ahead? more thing? So, yeah. Salim, can you, can you discuss or give us a little bit of an idea of where ECMO falls in? on this uh, surviving sepsis issue? That's a great question. And so the, as you keep going down that, that uh, pathway, when you, so in patients who have not responded to vasopressors, they're still hypotensive. You start hydrocortisone, you give them a bolus, and they still are hypotensive at that point. Um, warm or cold, uh, uh, you know, ir irrespective. They're still hypotensive at that point. Uh, three things have been brought up as adjuncts. One is extracorporeal life support, or ECMO. Uh, the other is the use of, what is the use of renal replacement therapy? And three, the use of plasmapheresis as an adjunct in this situation. Of the three, the one that's been studied the most and is still in use is extracorporeal life support. And it's not formally mentioned in the sepsis guidelines, but it certainly is there as an adjunct so that in, in, in institutions where you have 
the ability to use ECMO or uh, extracorporeal life support that in those patients who are still not responding uh, to initiate and consider ECMO in that situation. The survival for patients who went on ECMO with severe sepsis with recalcitrant hypotension is about 46% overall when you look at it as all comers, which is better than zero. 